Next up on the programme, we're going to be looking at human factors and ergonomics. And as a surgeon with a bad neck, this is a subject close to my heart. What does the evidence tell us about the role of human factors and ergonomics in healthcare? And why haven't the approaches been more widely adopted? The session chair today is Matthew Woodward and a research associate at this institute. Over to you, Matthew. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the session. So this is Human Factors and Ergonomics in Healthcare, Successes and Challenges to Adoption. Uh, so yes, I'm a research associate here at this institute, uh, but previously I worked for many years in industry as a human factors engineer. So there are different interpretations about human factors, but the core definition is that it's about bringing knowledge of human behavior, capacities and limitations to the design of equipment, which could be a medical device, electronic health record, or a paper-based pro forma, and also to the, des the design of work systems. So for example, that could be a process uh, of communication and preparation for conducting pre-operative checks. And at the heart of all of this is the principle of using design to shape safe actions. So uh, I'm happy to say that I'm joined today by three excellent panelists. Uh, we have Ken Catchpole, who is a professor of human factors at the Medical University of South Carolina. Ken's career has taken him from some publishing some influential work in the UK around human factors in surgery, uh, and he now works and studies from the US. We have Susanna Stanford, who is a patient safety advocate. She is an ambassador for the Clinical Human Factors Group that's been very influential here in the UK. And uh, she's been instrumental in campaigning for and the authoring of a guidance for the testing of neuroaxial blocks for cesarean sections. And that guidance has rec recently been published in the journal Anesthesia. And we also have Mark Sujan, who works for the Health Services Safety Investigation Body. Uh, he is also a director of Human Factors Everywhere Consultancy. So we've got some great discussions to come. However, before we get started with the discussion, we have a short presentation from Professor Catchpot. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Ken Catchpole. I'm at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm going to talk about human factors and ergonomics in healthcare. Um, I've been involved in this work for about 20 years, and I'm going to try and give you an, uh, my view around the, some of the successes and challenges to adop adoption. Um, so um, Steve Sharp talks about the fact that there are four kinds of human factors, four interpretations of human factors. One is the, the human factor. It's often There's often a focus of blame. The second is really the idea of factors of humans, how humans you know, work, cognition, perception, memory, fatigue, you know, and that, that kind of leads to behavioral interventions and thinking about human behavior. Uh, the third one is the factors affecting humans, the idea that behavior isn't just about intent, um, but is in fact influenced by the world around us. You know, um, through our environment, organisation, design. And the, the, the fourth one, the socio-technical systems perspective, which says that, yeah, that's absolutely the tr truth, but all these things are interacting all the time. So there isn't a linear relationship between, um, between human behaviour and, uh, and these, all these different uh, systems factors. And so really it's a kind of move from the idea of focusing on the person much more towards the system and focusing from intent to the influence of you know, uh, external factors and indeed ultimately the question of how much free will do we have. Um, and, and so really kind of divide these two, the kind of behavioral and human uh, sort of behavioral change approaches are, are often popular with clinicians, educators and, you know, and psychologists. Um, and the, 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 the factors affecting humans and the socio-technical systems, the systems end of things is much more the kind of domain of human factors professionals, engineers and safety scientists. So the idea of the human factor comes about within healthcare really as a kind of surrogate for blame, uh, that people talk about the human factor as being the cause of incidents. That's really because it's kind of unacceptable to talk about human error, but that's really what they mean. 
Um, the other piece of this is around, you know, the, 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 the finding that communication might have a big influence uh, on clinical incidents. And so this is where we start to think about and have uh, the influence of things like teamwork and non-technical skills. Um, uh, so here we have team, the Team Steps framework, um, which has been very popular in the U.S., um, and the kind of non-technical skills frameworks from the University of Aberdeen and Steve Yule and Brenda Flynn and some of their colleagues has been really, really you know, influential uh, um, and, uh, and become in, embedded in a lot of clinical work. And of course, there's, there's actually a whole bunch of meta-analyses around this um, and systematic reviews that suggest that this, you know, this is a good idea. It's, teamwork training is a good idea. More, I think, problematically is that by focusing only on the human, it allows systems problems to... Uh, to deeper systems problems to perpetuate. And we had an experience of this working with this team on non-technical skills um, about a year and a half before there was a tragic, tragic accident um, that, um, uh, that really derived from a much deeper systems problem that maybe wasn't recognized by this kind of teamwork training. And, I did, and indeed, I think uh, as human factor scientists, um, we often see that there's lots of persistent myths and that the analogies aren't very work, aren't, aren't great. Um, and that there are wicked problems that underlie um, a lot of, you know, what's seen as evidence, but actually um, in retro, you know, in with further analysis, it, it's the story is not nearly as straightforward as, as we hoped it might be. Um, so, because really, you know, the human factors derives from aviation, not in the 70s with teamwork, but with the design of aircraft cockpits in the 40s, where we realized that the design, for example, of switches um, it, here between gear and flaps could have a fundamental impact on, uh, on safety and aircraft accidents. So rather than training people out of it, we could design systems that, uh, that would indicate to the users how they were working. Uh, and so this is, um, and, and one of the issues with this is it's kind of hidden. There's good design we don't always see. But, you know, more importantly, this is not something that we do in healthcare. This is Bob Wachter. I interview, in, interviewed uh, Boeing's top cockpit designers who wouldn't dream of green lighting a new plane until they'd spent thousands of hours watching pilots in simulations. Yet this has been woefully lacking in healthcare software design. Um, the real spread and influence here has been uh, on design has been driven by the FDA in the USA, um, who have really specified the fact that there needs to be a human factors analysis of every new device. These guidance has been around since about 2010. And so the kind of examples of this are in um, human centered design, in device design, in electronic health records, in drugs packaging, in home care architecture, alarm fatigue, which, by the way, is a misnomer, uh, and, and now in artificial intelligence. So this has been a great way to get some of these principles into healthcare. There are challenges, you know, that, that actually the clinicians and engineers don't often work together. It's really difficult for device designers to get in to see the real work as it's done. The clinicians are often blind to how the devices affect their, their behavior. And I, we've had some instances of certain devices creating, for example, medication failures um, uh, that have been blamed on individuals, but actually are a, a fundamental design problem. And so there's this is problem is invisible, there's limited reporting, there's poor data on causation because big people don't know to report it. Here are two examples of uh, two different interosseous um, in, um, bone injection devices, one of which, uh, through its design, allows uh, a serious hand injury by the user. Top one is it's possible to reverse um, uh, and, and harm yourself. And yet these designs are still out there and clinicians usually blame themselves. There's also kind of big organizational challenges with this. The, the way organizations buy in their, their technologies um, is not necessarily based on, on human factors or usability principles. And the device designers you know, maybe don't want to be liable for um, the, the, the harms that some of their designs might create. Um, so moving more towards real safety science, that's not about individual behavior or indeed only design, but about the socio-technical system. 
the relationship between um, uh, different components of the system that even Jim Reason, who's known for his Swiss cheese, has talked about, but it's kind of largely been absent from the a lot of the healthcare safety narrative. Um, apart from SEEPS, the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety, which has been really, really influential and is really the kind of de facto um, socio-technical systems model um, for understanding patient safety um, and, and it's been becoming more and more influential. It was great to see how it's been implemented within the patient safety incident response framework. Um, and that's, you know, a really, really uh, um, important development. Uh, but there are, you know, many other things. Um, safety two, or what's called resilience engineering, not to be confused with individual resilience, um, resilience engineering ideas, and indeed things like naturalistic, naturalistic decision making, how experts really make decisions, not as information processors. All of these things are, are, are starting to become and generate some interest. But really, what they say is that people aren't the bad, I, you know, aren't the bad thing. That people hold the system together, and rather than looking at errors, maybe it's more useful to look at what makes everyday performance successful. Um, and really, it becomes about understanding and valuing not just the clinical expertise um, of clinicians, but actually how they work within these complex, uncertain, sometimes dysfunctional systems. Um, the challenges here are that there's a bewildering theory of collections, you know, bewildering um, uh, range of theories and techniques. Um, this is really, really complex. Uh, it's uh, uh, um, uh, there's important lessons for implementation science, but it's profoundly challenging for clinicians and clinical science. So here's you know here's a, this is an example of the number of outcomes that anesthesiologists have to balance when they try and make decisions about medication delivery. So in this respect, error becomes not about who did what wrong, but why was the wrong trade-off made between essentially uh, things that, that are in competition, uh, goals that are in competition. So the other way in which this work has been, um, uh, is being spread um, to try and break the, down these barriers between, you know, the, the kind of the, the clinical perceptions and the application of, you know, this complex socio-technical systems theories within healthcare is really through the embedded clin cl clinical human factors practitioners. These are professionals who are now working within healthcare organizations, often, you know, only in ones or twos, but really um, trying to look at and address and, um, uh, all these different and, and apply all these different human factors methods at the front line, working alongside clinicians as a way of kind of drip feeding these ideas into healthcare systems. Human factors and ergonomics in healthcare, so, so the applications have, have largely been, been um, you know, driven by clinicians, with a, often with a limited interpretation of human factors principles, and tend to, be, tend to have been focused on directly changing the behavior of the people in the system through teamwork training or checklists or, non, on, or kind of non-technical skills frameworks, all of which are valid, but actually only tell half the story. The socio-technical systems approaches that are used in safety science are really, really challenging for clinicians and clinical um, uh, and clinical science and clinical journals and clinical funders and actually, you know, particularly for administrators. And so th there's a kind of there's been a resistance to these ideas because this stuff is kind of painful and, and worrying. And so, you know, in this case, regulation has had to drive adoption because really what we're talking about at here is that patient safety is about being willing to go together into a messy unpredictable, uncertain world with competition resources and ultimately unreachable goals over which we might have limited control, which doesn't sound very appealing, but we can nevertheless make progress in this area if we're willing to go there. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ken. That was a good stimulating uh, start for us. Uh, and it seems like we're seeing perhaps different levels of adoption depending on which type of human factors we're talking about. Um, I wonder if I could um, ask you to reflect, because you've obviously spent a number of years working in the UK and then the US. Do you see a different picture in terms of the uptake 
the barriers and the facilitators between the US and the UK? Um, so, um, so what I sort of talked about, so I think there's been much more of an interest in uh in the kind of system so in the uk there's been a you know there's been a very much a focus on the kind of behavioral change on uh non-technical skills on kind of teamwork training in the us there has been that and that's been kind of driven by simulation but there's also been um i i talked about the wider you know wider influence of 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 the fda for example and i realized in my talk i didn't reflect the uk experience of that um which i i know less about but you know the that within that, um, but you know the MHRA and of course the devices that are used in the US used in the UK too. So so that's been so the FDA has has been particularly influential. And there's there's been this uh, you know I also talked about this kind of embed, embedded clinical practice um, that certainly I noticed um, in the US more more human factors professionals becoming employed working at hospitals rather than it being done by clinicians or or being done by dev device designers there's actually been an interesting growth in that in the uk too um, um that um but I, I think the us kind of system um has had more spare capacity to do that um, because of uh, the financial models, that sort of thing. But generally, they, I think, they are, you know, they're, there's, they're, they're complementary and, and, and traveling a, a similar path. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, I think there's been a slightly greater influence, interest um, in the kind of in the systems thinking, the socio-technical systems thinking, and as a result, the employment of these embedded clinical practitioners slightly more than there has been in the UK, which is largely and still is largely dominated, I think, by the um, by the kind of behavioral approach, which has its, you know, uh, which, as I said, is, is um, uh, has has its validity, but also uh, its limitations. Hmm. It's interesting. So that particularly strong regulatory approach from the FDA in the States, to some extent, perhaps drives the need for professional human factors. Uh, practitioners, which in turn means you've got this base of professionals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, um, Susanna, if I could uh, turn to you, thanks for joining us. Um, you, you've kind of really lived this and worked with clinicians in terms of getting some human factors principles into to guidelines such as the neuroaxial block guidance. Um, I just wondered if I could ask you to reflect on your experience of that process and the things that made it perhaps easier to adopt or, or more difficult to get through. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, so in terms of those those guidelines, what was really interesting was that, I mean, I identified really early on that it was non-technical skills and human factors, which were creating a lot of the problems around block testing. Um, and that came from the fact I'd surveyed 150 mothers and, and really similar thing, themes were coming up. And it was very much around the, the patients speak, trying to speak up and the clinicians seeming to dismiss their pain or, or, or otherwise sort of diminish it. And it was very much as if they were doubting the patients rather, rather than questioning their blocks. And I kind of asked, well, what was it about the situation which made it hard for people to speak up? And were there other things about that same situation that were making it hard for clinicians to hear? Because that led me to human factors. Um, when we got to doing the guidelines, which took a very long time to persuade people that they were going to be necessary to, to achieve some you know, t change here, um, well, it was very interesting because there were, there were myself and eight others on the author group and I'm going, look, we really need to have the human factors considerations in here that are absolutely key. This is where a lot of the error is happening. And everybody goes, well, yes, yes, that's absolutely the case. But such was the level of human factors knowledge amongst the clinicians that, that I was asked to go away and write it. Um, now, not really qualified. Um, <laughs> certainly not. I do a first draft and then I go to my colleagues at the clinical human factors group. Thank goodness I had them to turn to. Um, and that included people like Rona Flynn, as well as people who were anaesthetists. So I had both, both the human factors expertise and the clinical side. Um, and, and actually I've done a pretty good stab at it, which was a relief. Um, but then what was really fascinating, having got this into the guidelines, and I'm thinking, there we go, you know, we've done it, we're, you know, we're on the way they get reviewed within the Obstetric Anaesthetist Association. And someone says, 
Oh, well, this is all very interesting, but it's not usual to include this sort of content in clinical guidelines. And the recommendation was to take it out. Um, mm. yes. Right? So, yeah, interesting. Uh, um, I prevailed. So yeah. they're in. So happy days. Thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> But it was really fascinating that, that you know, that like how how far we have to come. Um, yeah. I do think so. That's probably going about four years, and I think things are actually changing surprisingly quickly. Certainly, I've been involved in the national safety standards for invasive procedures more recently. Human factors were right in there from the beginning. The this institute has been doing the avoiding brain injury in childbirth project recently and again human factors right in from the beginning um i think the national the nhs patient safety strategy says now that human factors considerations need to be included in all guidelines so there's mm. progress um yeah. but it's from quite a low base yeah that's that's really interesting both a that you know you you, you kind of had to take that on yourself to push that through but thankfully you had the support of the chfg um but also perhaps a bit of uh, reluctance there which reflects back to what Ken said really about mindset sometimes. It's just perhaps not in the mindsets of certain people. I wanted to add though, there's been some really nice supportive pieces in that same um, journal about, about the guidelines. So I think it has struck a chord with, with a number of clinicians, which is great. Um, and Mark, hello, thanks for, for joining us. Um, I wanted to ask for your view because something we sometimes hear uh, as a, a barrier uh, to getting human factors and ergonomics more widely adopted is that we don't have enough people with the right skills and education. There's just too few HF professionals around. Um, I wonder if you could just kind of reflect on, on that and the kind of things we might do uh, as a discipline to improve that situation. Mm. Of course, I mean, that's right. So if you look at the current status, um, it's certainly true. However, what I like to do is go back in time um, and take a more optimistic view. Because I remember when I started in patient safety, which is now 25 years ago, um, I underwent kind of several changes of identity So because nobody knew what I was. And so initially I was um, a safety expert, but then I morphed into a health services researcher a qualitative researcher. And then eventually, as time has moved on, I was able to out myself. I'm a human factor specialist. And now it makes sense to people, they, they get it. And also the conversations which we had you know, at the uh, beginning of the millennium compared to now were so different, so kind of naive in many ways. And now we can have really mature conversations uh, in this forum uh, as well as in others. If you look at the literature, uh, it's much more diverse. So I think I'm taking a very positive uh, perspective. Yeah. And so your question, what, what can we do? Well, first of all, change is happening. So for example, Susanna mentioned the patient safety strategy. The strategy has human factors written all over it. Uh, part of the strategy is the national patient safety syllabus, which um, has a significant amount of human factors uh, input uh, and expertise going right through it. Part of the strategy is also, of course, PSERF, which Ken already alluded to, the patient safety and response framework. Um, and we need to mention, uh, you know, responsible people like Tracy Hurley, for example, at NHS England, who are chartered agronomists and who have been driving these developments. So I think that is, that is excellent to see and be, become really positive. What we need to do is, of course, a number of things. Education and training, uh, I think, is really important. Um, we were saying, do we need more qualified HF experts, or should we train uh, clinicians to uh, you know, be knowledgeable in human factors? It's probably a mixture of both, I would say. But um, what we see, at least in the NHS, is a massive expansion in the availability of human factors training available to clinicians. Um, so we have the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. Uh, they have a healthcare learning pathway, which is currently run by Loughborough University. Um, but this enables clinicians is to set them on a course. Well, first of all, to be part of the human factors community, but also set them on a course to become uh, you know, a specialist. So a human factor specialist with accreditation, um, which I think is really, really useful. Um, 
of course, where I work at the Health Services Safety Investigations Body, we, of course, uh, provide a lot of education. I think we had last year over 10,000 enrollments from people within the NHS, uh, you know, who looked at the systems approach to patient safety incident investigations and other courses. So I think there's a lot to be, uh, to be hopeful uh, of, and education is definitely expanding significantly currently. Yeah, thank you. And I think as you, yeah, having that education base then just helps other projects develop from that. And I do think as well, it's important that the courses are accredited. So we've got the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors in the UK, it's a professional body, and they accredit courses to make sure that they're delivered to a sufficient standard. So, so that's good. Um, uh, Ken, if I might come to you again, we've got a very popular question from the, from the listeners here. Um, which is how translatable are the lessons about human factors from one culture to another? And here they reference culture in terms of are the lessons from air safety the same as those in healthcare and social care? And I think, you know, that is a kind of ongoing debate in the human factors and economics world for a long time. But, but I, at the heart of that, there is a good question there, isn't there? What, what is the, what, can human factors in healthcare learn from what's been done elsewhere in other industries? So, um, so the, the the short answer is yes, we can learn a lot, but we need to carefully translate. We can't just say, oh, just because they do it in aviation, it's going to work in healthcare. There are there are some similarities and there are some profound differences. Um, you know, the similarities, uh, you know, and I talked about it, the, 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 you know, are in terms of, you know, definitely in kind of terms of, um, uh, in terms of design, there's a lot more that we could do, do that we're not doing uh, in terms of design in aviation. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of learning from incidents, um, and I know that there's been, you know, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's been a lot, you know, a, a lot of progress in, 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 in taking the skills of, you know, in, ac incident, accident investigation, um, uh, and, and, and applying those in healthcare. Um, you know, I, th I think some of the, the ways in which it do doesn't work is, um, you know, aviation, um, <laughs> I've got to be careful. I don't have upset people, but, you know, a a aviation is, it, it has relatively clear goals and can be and has a lot of engineering um and so um it can you know so there's a lot more clarity about um things that go right and things that go wrong with healthcare we're also you know and by the way you know the, the, you know i talk about what i could term the the um the uh, the mortality problem and nobody is is ever expected to die on an aircraft and if if people die in in aviation you know that's immediately seen as a uh, and should be seen as a problem. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that luxury in healthcare. Everyone ultimately will die either receiving care or because they didn't receive care. And so, knowing even when something has gone wrong or not is much more profoundly difficult in healthcare than it is in aviation. And this this has really really. Um, difficult implications for both understanding incidents, but also how we make the right trade-offs and how we understand the trade-offs that are being made because healthcare is, you know, there is a, ultimately a limited amount of resources. Um, and so um, so this, this kind of, so knowing what right looks like is profoundly more difficult in healthcare than it is in aviation. And my some and I, I think it's sometimes viewed simplistically, and many people actually still don't get this, that, that I think it leads to some simplistic kind of assumptions that are then translated into healthcare that don't work, but but necessarily yeah, that the that it's not necessarily recognized that way. So yeah, absolutely, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a kind of human design level, absolutely, there's lots we can do. But actually, an organizational level, there are some profound differences that we've got to be really careful about. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 that's, that's good advice. So yes, we can learn. Some of it's translatable, but we really need to think about context. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Susanna, I, I might come to you on this one because it's really around the non-technical skills as, as they're known sometimes. Um, the question is, as a socio-technical approach, 
alongside all the better design of systems and technologies, do we also need to think about the design of teams? So how they put together and the skill mix and so forth. Is that something, for example, that you, that's coming to your work with some of the national guidance, thinking about the team aspects? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. In terms of the um, safety standards for invasive procedures, that's very much around, have you got the right you know, have you got the right people? Have you got the right team? Have you got the right patient? Have you got the right kit? Um, you know, and 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 also very much about the the time points within the patient journey where those things need to be checked, um, and and that sort of consistent checking that and and really the focus on using the team as as you know to miss to to work safely to have a culture of working safely, to try to reduce error. And to to sort of take the the kind of the onus off the one person to say, well, it's everybody's problem and everybody's job. Um, mm. So the team is really key. It does loop back around to what Ken's just been saying, though, in that we can't, you know, it's really easy to be a little bit simplistic about it. But obviously, you know, just like planes don't take off without the right people, sometimes you've got procedures going ahead where you don't have the usual team or you don't have quite the skill mix that would be ideal. Um, and very often you've got people who have not, never worked together before. And, and so there's an awful lot. And when people are under time pressure, the things that get dropped are things like team briefs. Um, and, and it's the really basic things, which are actually really, really key for trying to get everybody to behave, you know, to, to get that safety in. The flip side is that actually this thing, to so just to sort of give some of the positivity, um, these things are, become, are beginning to become really entrenched. And even when you move people out of their normal environment, they are now resorting to that kind of behavior. So I was listening to um, the guy who runs the the medical tent for the Great North Run, which is the most enormous undertaking. They have up 28 HGU beds in a tent, um, you know, huge deal. And when they had to go to intubate somebody a couple of years ago, the team, who of course have you know, from all over the place, they're all volunteers, they've gathered for the day, and they went to do it, and they all immediately clicked into a WHO checklist of who was going to do, who was there, who was going to do what. And it was so instinctive to them to use that to guide how they were going to go forward. So that mm. is massive progress. Um, yeah, because yeah. it's a checklist, but they yeah. did it. Yeah, and actually also a really nice illustration that this is both about human behavior and the design of the environment that helps people work in a particular way. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, and there's, an, there's a very good meaty question here, which, um, Mark, I, I'll address to you in the first instance, um, which is, are human factors and ergonomics methods any different from quality improvement pro approaches? And, and if so, what's the difference there? Well, I, I do remember, um, Ken, did you not write even a paper about that? But um, so, um, well, there's my, been a paper. yeah. My my view on that is, first of all, I speak from a human factors ergonomics perspective. I don't consider myself a quality improvement expert, so I might misrepresent uh, that position. But um, so in the past, I have worked with people who have done lean, for example. What I found is simply that their focus was different in the brain. Um, I remember. Back in 2008, we did a project on reliability. Um, and, you know, even though, yeah, even though it was an interesting project in many ways, but just the focus of reliability, which came from the manufacturing industry. And back in those days, that goes back to my earlier point, how our culture has changed and the discussion has changed in the NHS. Back then, it was all about, let's look at manufacturing. They've got super reliable processes. The NHS needs to become a high reliability organization, and the processes need to be reliable. And so we started investigating the reliability of processes so that we can say, look, you start your car in the morning when you go to work, and you expect it to work every day. You wouldn't accept if it were to break just once uh, during the week. But in the NHS, we accept subpar reliability. So to cut a long story short, the focus there was on reliability, but not really on the social technical system, on the interactions and the wider, uh, let's say, outcomes, or the wider range of outcomes we want to consider. So as I was saying, it might be misrepresenting um, because for sure, uh, there will be well-informed people 
with a quality improvement background to have a similar uh, attitude. So I would say, if we can agree that the systems perspective is important, if we agree that we want to look at the interactions between different elements of the work system, and we look at a broad range of outcomes, not just uh, efficiency, for example, of productivity, um, but also, for example, staff well-being, uh, patient experience, these kind of issues, then actually they are probably quite closely aligned, even though they have very different histories, uh, to be quite clear. Yes, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, and in fact, a reflection I would have is that often quality of improvement tends to want to make a change very early in a project life cycle and then test it and see what happens, your PDSA cycles. Human factors and ergonomics in general perhaps would spend a bit more time up front evaluating and trying to analyze the system before recommending a change. But there's definitely strengths of, from both um, practice, practices. Right, we're really, really short on time. So if anyone's got a very quick fire answer to this question, please jump in. The question is, I'm a GP. I'm struck by the huge potential of human factors to inform design and general practice, but wonder how the thousands of practices out, out there will be able to garner human factors expertise tailored to the specific context of their practice. Anyone got a nice solution for this GP for us? I think it's a real challenge, isn't it? Ken, you want to jump so, in? Um, so the question was, if, I, if I'm a GP and I'm interested in human factors, how do I start up applying that sort of work? Is that... Is, is in that, the local uh, context. Um, mm. In a local context. So um, so uh, there are some sort of basic books to, to give you a perspective. Uh, so uh, books by, for example, Sidney Decker or Eric Colnagel are really useful. Um, there are people you can reach out to, the CHFG, uh, the... Um, uh, and the the Chartered Institute, um, there's you know, or you can start with uh, you know observing and making change yourself using the, a combination of quality improvement and kind of human factors methods. Um, you can also find GPs um, who are starting to try and think about this yourself, um, or um, find your local you know the, uh, uh, you know or, or through something like CHFG find a local um, expert who uh, who could you know, come and just have a half an hour phone call. You can get so much from a really basic perspective on this that could give you hundreds of things to think about. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and, uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I think there are all sorts of, there's such a rich way to do this. There are, there are those would be some Thank of the you. methods yeah. you could do. And then you're on a journey and recognize it's not a solution, but it's a journey. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. And that's a good plug there. The, uh, there's a, very good website, ergonomics.org.uk, and that does have a link for the UK for various resources and people that can provide support um, who are qualified in human factors and ergonomics. So with that, um, I would like to say thank you to all of my panelists here today. Thank you to you, the audience, for uh, listening and for your many, many questions. For those that we didn't get to, uh, I'm sorry. However, we do have a meet the speakers session tomorrow. Um, I will certainly be there myself, so do come along and we can pick up the conversation. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back over to Liz. Thank you.